Hello everyone, we're now going to look at the second video of the sequence of acid base theory videos. So let's get to it. Uh, we're actually going to start with the last page I had on the previous video, uh, which I guess was the overlap to the second video. So I think the last part, the last thing we looked at in the first acid base theory video was this um, graph where it had nitric acid and water. It's a strong acid. So we have the predominant species. You can see from the graphic here that there are no reactants left. And I commented it makes no sense to write HNO3 aqueous when that doesn't really exist in solution. It really only makes sense to write NO3 minus and H3O plus seen as that exclusively exists in aqueous solution. Okay. The reason for that being located there was so we can contrast it with the following. If we can contrast that with nitrous acid, which is a weak acid, HNO2, um, we can see here that the predominant species in this weak acid is not NO2 minus an, H, an H3O plus like it was for nitric acid. It's just HNO2. You know, if you had to represent what is this in the beaker, you would never say it's product. You would say, oh, it's HNO2. Um, so absolutely, the predominant species is HNO2. <clears throat> so let's uh, remind each other of that. This is the predominant species. because that's mostly what you see in the beaker. Okay. Um, let's start to write, and I think some of this will be a duplicate because some of my annotations in the first video um, are gonna be formally introduced here. But, um, but let's remind each other of what they were anyway. So weak acids in equilibrium, we can look at a general uh, law of mass action expression, an equilibrium constant expression. Here, the subscript C just means we're considering concentration. So we have our generic uh, equation for an acid. So we have HA and water to give A minus and hydronium. Then according to the law of mass action, we have the product of the products raised to the molar coefficients. In this case, it's one molar coefficient each divided by the product of the reactants raised to the molar coefficients. And we actually don't have to write water because water is a liquid. It doesn't partake in dynamic equilibrium or it has no net effect in dynamic equilibrium. It's just a constant, so we can ignore it. And we're left with our KC expression and because we acknowledge that the argument, remember in the last video, I said that you have an argument and an environment on the left side of the expression. The argument is an acid. So we replace the subscript C with A to remind each other we have an acid system rather than just a concentration system. And we've said that if you're strong, your K value is greater than one. And if you're weak, your K value is less than one. So we've said everything here, I believe, in video one. But this is new, p-values. So p, by definition, is negative log base 10. So you can p anything. So p, by definition, is just negative log base 10. So it's a logarithmic power um, that's from the log 10. The negative is just so that we have positive answers, um, which I'll more than likely annotate a little bit later. Okay, so if we apply the P to Ka, we just get minus log base 10 Ka. Uh, therefore, if we want to Let's say we have the Ka and we want the pKa, we can just minus log base 10 it. Conversely, if we have the pKa and we want to go back to the Ka, 
we just take the base 10. So where did this 10 come from? It was the base 10. Uh, and then we raise it to the minus pKa and we get return back to the Ka again. Um, now, let's see if I can, no, I can't scroll after I annotate, so I have to delete my annotation. Very clunky, but that's the software I have right now. Um, we'll explain these trends, but let's at least state the trends for now. Um, and I'll try and summarize all the trends we've seen so far. Um, Let's see, uh, acidity is proportional to hydronium concentration. Um, which is proportional to Ka, right? So these are all proportional. So a strong acid has a high concentration of hydronium, has a large K value. So these are all proportional, but we can see here that it's proportional to the inverse of pKa. Um, so this inverse or indirect proportionality with the pKa, this is because of the log and you recall from your, your log rules that log, for example, um, of a fraction, a positive log of one fraction is the negative log of the inverse fraction. So um, this inverse proportionality comes from the inverse that happens when we have a negative log and that's exactly what we have here. Um, so essentially our hydronium ion we would take the inverse of our hydronium ion as soon as we have that P involved. Or if you apply it to the Ka, we would just take the inverse of our law of mass action expression. So we have this uh, inverse proportionality. So we would expect um, small pKa values for strong acids, large pKa values for weak acids. Okay, let's scroll on. Here's some values. So um, I guess we're looking at bases here. So these are all strong bases. Now, just to remind you of some interweaving vocab, if these are all strong bases, uh, we can say that these are all strong electrolytes. And therefore, these ions, these solvated ions, are the predominant species. That means uh, in solution, obviously. If you just have LiOH solid, your predominant species is LiOH solid. Um, so I should probably clarify in solution. Um, so if you have lithium hydroxide aqueous, it would make little sense to write LiOH aqueous when you don't have any LiOH aqueous. You have Li plus aqueous and you have OH minus aqueous. Okay. Um, let's do the same, but let's write Kb because for the most part, we look at acids, but we have to remember we can also do the same with bases. So we can see here in this expression, uh, if we had weak bases, for example, oh, incidentally, why don't we look at a law of mass action for strong bases? So that, that might be something you might wonder. Well, if it's strong, although technically everything is in equilibrium, uh, a strong system is shifted far right. So the return concentrations are just very, very small. 
and we can, for the most part, ignore them. So it would make no sense to consider the return reaction in a strong system because it would be negligible or we at least accept that it's negligible. So it wouldn't make any sense to have a law of mass action for a strong system. So therefore we don't have a, an equilibrium expression for a strong system. So that's why we only, you'll only see it in these notes for a weak system. So back to it, a weak base only partially dissociates. So here we would have the predominant species because it's weak. Um, you know, KB would be less than one. And why is it KB? Remember B means base. Well, that's because our argument is a base and our environment is an acid, but we're not writing the expression for the environment, we're writing it for the argument. You know, I, I'm hesitant to use the word system. I know if, as soon as I say the word environment, it makes sense to say, oh, you mean the system as well? No, because the system really would be the chemical reaction. So I don't wanna use the word system and environment, but I wanna say the argument you know, like if it were a, if it were a play, you'd have the scene with the main person speaking, and then you'd have um, the additional cast that's kind of just in the background. So here, the water is just everywhere, and it, you're not really looking at the water; it's in the in your periphery. But you're paying attention to the ammonia. That's what I mean by argument. Okay, and we have the law of mass action here. Um, now, before I go ahead and annotate things that are coming up ahead of time, and maybe I can annotate it. It kind of comes up, but not in massive amount. Okay, I'll annotate it here. So we've got KB. Let's say um, I wanted KA. So let's say I have KB here. Then I could write KA. Uh, and it will come up in subsequent slides, but we'll stick it in here. Um, there's a, an equation, KW is KA, KB. So KA, if, I want, if I'm given KB and I want KA, then I could just say that KA is KW over KB, where KW just stands for water dissociation constant. Uh, and B obviously is the base dissociation constant. Uh, we'll actually plug some numbers into this in a little bit. Um, but maybe I can show you, um, I don't know if I have space here or on the next slide to show you um, exactly how this comes about. Well, I might, I might try and squeeze it on here a bit. Um, maybe I'll change the color to, I don't know, purple looks cool. Do we like purple? Yes, we love purple. All right, let me, let me try and squish it in, squish it in nobly here. Um, so if ever you're given KA and you need KB, you can use its relationship to KW uh, to solve for the thing you're not given. And oftentimes in an exam question, you might be given an argument with a base, but you're given a KA value. Dope. Now we've got to figure out what the right value is. And if you're not careful, you plow ahead, don't realize you've been given something you don't really need, but you've been given the basis of something that you do need. You just have to realize that you have to go process what you've been given. Um, all right, so enough of my yapping. Let me write something. Um, let me write H A. All right, so H A plus water. So this is a generic acid. Give hydronium and A minus. So that would be K A hydronium. 
a minus over H A. Now let's write K, let's do a base. So I'm gonna take this base, the conjugate base here. We've got the base, let's put it in water and it can generate H A plus O H minus. Okay, and here we've got KB, which is HA, OH minus over A minus. Okay, so if I clear up a little bit of room down here, so let me get rid of this. We'll actually see where that comes from. Okay, let's go back to our really cool purple color. Okay, so we've got an acid, we've got a base, we've got a K value and a KB value. If I were to combine, if I were to combine these together, um, well, I would cancel spectator ions, right? So I can see that uh, I've got A common to both. So anything on the reactant side that's also in the product side will cancel. A will cancel and HA will cancel. So all I'm left with is uh, hydronium and hydroxide. Nope, sorry. I'm left with two lots of water, I'm sorry. I'm left with two lots of water and hydronium and hydroxide, right? Which is your first hint to where the water comes from. Now, when you combine equations, remember you take the product of the K values. So when I say combine K, I don't mean add. I mean, take the product. Um, so if I've got K, A, K, B, that's what it means to combine K values. Um, then you can see that I would have basically put them side by side and then the a would cancel the A because I'd have an A as a denominator and an A as a numerator. Likewise, I'd have an HA as a, denom as a numerator and an HA as a denominator. So I'd be left with hydronium hydroxide. Well, if I take this water expression and I wrote a K, Okay, for water, I would just write hydronium hydroxide. So we've got KW as the product of KA, KB. Okay. Okay, so you can pause the video and have a look at that. Okay, so we've said ad nauseum that weak anything only partially ionizes, so we have the intact predominant species. Uh, so again, the predominant species are gonna be these guys. These are all predominant species. Okay, because they're all weak. And we can see here the K values are less than one. Um, Etc. So that's good. That all makes sense. Which is the weakest though? So obviously you're weak if your K value is less than one, but the smaller it is, the even weaker you are. 
So clearly aniline is the, is the weakest base here. So aniline would be the weakest of the weak. Um, and we can see here that methylamine would be the strongest of the weak because its value is the largest. Um, it's still weak, but out of a, a list of weak objects, it's, it's gonna be the least weak out of the lot. Um, so we can start to gauge strength based on K values. But for all of these, equilibrium would be shifted left favoring reactants. And hence we write the predominant species as the reactant. Okay, um, leveling effect. So again, in general chemistry, for the most part, we'll be dealing with aqueous environments. So you are only, you know, just like a, a, a cage, you can only put things in the cage that are weaker than the cage. If you start to put things in a cage stronger than the cage, you won't have a cage anymore. Um, here, our cage is water, so we can only talk about things that are weaker, weaker than water. So if you put an acid in water, the strongest thing you can produce is hydronium. Uh, anything that's stronger than hydronium will destroy water, and then you're not really in water anymore. So hydronium is the strongest proton donor that can exist in water. Uh, and all strong acids have the same strength in water, because they're completely converted to hydronium. So a strong acid literally just tells water, hey, make your maximum amount of hydronium, please. And then that's it. Um, now, remember, we said earlier that water can be an acid and a base. So it's amphi uh, amphoteric generally, but specifically because it involves protons, it's amphiprotic. Um, because it has the ability to form an acid and a base, that ability comes from its auto-ionization. So auto-ionization just means self-splitting. Um, so let me annotate that. Auto-ionization just means self-splitting. So, uh, water can actually, you know, water the argument in water the environment can form hydronium and hydroxide. So water the argument in water the environment can self-split. And this is where our KW came from. And this is one by 10 to the negative 14 at room temperature at 25 Celsius. This would be the K value I would suggest that you memorize. Um, you don't have to memorize any of the K value, but remember we said earlier, if you have a KA and you want a KB, you need to use that KW conversion. It's no good if you don't know KW. So I would commit this to memory at 25 degrees. Remember K is a thermodynamic property. So it's temperature sensitive. So it won't always be one by 10 to the negative 14, but it is at 25 degrees. So we should remember that. Um, so water is auto ionizing to some extent. The reason why you consider water as H2O and not as a mixture of hydronium and hydroxide is the predominant species are H2O. So water is the predominant species because the, it's weak, it's a weak electrolyte. K is a lot less than one.
Okay, <clears throat> let's look at that equation again, and we'll look at um, in a bit more detail. So we have water the argument, water the environment. Either either the argument or the environment environment can be the acid or base, doesn't matter. But in the Brenstead system, we have conjugate pairs. So the way these are being divvied up, we have the branched Lowry base and the conjugate acid. So branched Lowry base, going with the conjugate acid, the branched Lowry acid, going with the conjugate base. They differ by plus or minus one proton, remember? If we just wrote the K expression for concentration, we'd have the products over the reactants, but we remember that we have liquids as denominators here. We ignore liquids as solids in equilibrium expressions. So we just have the surviving numerator and we have this KW constant, which I have recommended that you memorize. So memorize. Um, we know from our math knowledge, I guess, that um, 10 to the A, 10 to the B is 10 to the A plus B. So here we've got 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus seven is 10 to the minus 14. So the minus 14 is the KW value. And we took the product of the hydronium concentration and the hydroxide concentration and therefore, they must each be 10 to the negative 7. So in water, water is neutral. Because it's equally acidic and basic. Equally acid and base. So we say that water is neither nor because it's both. So we say water is neutral. Uh, because it's it's not really um, it's not very either, but it's both to roughly the same extent. So when we dissolve a species in water, we just tilt the balance and exaggerate one of its natural properties more than the other. So we can exaggerate the hydroniumness of water, or exaggerate the hydroxideness of water. So in pure water, they're both the same. If we add an acid to water, we tilt the balance so the hydronium is now greater. So we have an overall acidic solution. If we add base to water, we increase the concentration of hydroxide so that it's greater than the hydronium now and we have a basic solution. But again, in pure water, they're the same. So we have a neutral solution. Um, okay. Um, and I think that looks like it's straightforward. Okay. The pH scale, the pH scale is another way in addition to the pKa scale from a previous, uh, was it this video or a previous video? I think it was a previous video. Yeah. Um, the pH scale is another way to look at strength. However, the pH scale is less versatile than the PK scale. Uh, uh, it's got a smaller range than the PK A scale. Um, and you could also have, if you want the POH, H here just means proton or hydronium. So it means acid. You could have a pOH scale, which would have a smaller range than the pKb scale. So typically we talk about acids and bases both in the acidic scale for historical reasons, but you could definitely 
talk about the POH scale for the base. Um, but historically, we tend to talk about bases on the pH scale. But pH or pKa, POH or pKb. Um, but again, you can tell where the smaller range comes from. It comes from the leveling effect of water, right? Smaller range due to that leveling effect of water. You know, pKa or pKb makes no mention of water. So we can go beyond the, the leveling uh, barrier of water. But pH, we're talking about water um, uh, in a protic environment. So we're, we're kind of limited to the leveling effect. OK. Um, the pH scale was developed as a convenient way to look at hydronium ion concentration. Yeah, so essentially these seven units, the seven units here are gonna be the acidic region. Remember we said that hydronium is 10 to the negative seven. And then basic, remember we said hydroxide was 10 to the negative seven uh, molarity for concentration. Um, well, the seven comes from the exponent here. Okay, so that's the exponent. We've got a base 10 and we've got a negative. We've got a base 10 and a negative. So to make this exponent a coefficient, that's why we log it. So we got the log to the base 10 to make the 10 to the negative seven becomes uh, negative seven, right? So we've now converted the exponent to a coefficient by using log base 10. Now, if we add a negative in front of the log, then the 10 to the negative seven becomes plus seven. So this is where eventually the plus seven comes from if we take the negative log base 10. So now you know uh, where this comes from and this we just relabel as P. Okay, so the reason for adding P is to make this negative exponent a positive coefficient, done. The range, the smaller range is only a 14 fold range. Uh, it's actually zero to 14, but we've only got 14 units and that's because we've got seven acid units, seven base units. And remember the sum to give us are, we do the same with the negative log we get positive 14. So it's because of the uh, the leveling effect of water only having 14 units for total for acid and base. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll do more annotations, but there's some stuff coming up that I can do on the next slide. Okay, you will be doing some calculations. Um, there's some unique significant figure rules when you have logs involved. Um, and we can see them here. The, they're not intuitive, I don't think, but they are important nonetheless. So only the digits that come after the decimal point in a pH value are significant. So for example, a pH of 6.23 only the digits after the decimal are significant, so it's only two sig figs. Um, 
the number of significant digits in the concentration determines the number of digits after the decimal place. So for example, if you're gonna calculate, remember pH is minus log base 10 of the hydronium ion concentration. So if you had a pH of 6.23, you know that you only have two significant figures in your hydronium concentration, vice versa. If your hydronium concentration has three sig figs, you know you need three digits in your pH reading um, because you have three sig figs. So that's the uh, non-intuitive significant figure rule for not just pH, but anything with a log rule, anything where you've logged a digit, that's how you propagate significance uh, through a logarithm. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got, I think we did a similar equation for PK values. So let's just remind each other. Uh, hydronium is base 10 to the minus pH, just as pH is minus log base 10 hydronium. Um, we can do similar things for O. H and that's on POH and that's on the next page. So I won't add it here. Um, notice that um, if you have a if you have a pH that's got um, zeros after the decimal, then you can just assume that that's immediately that five is just that five, and that twelve is just that twelve. Just remember the coefficient becomes an exponent and you add the negative sign because of the negative log. Um, so we can start to see some proportionalities here, can't we? So let's see, let me try and summarize the proportionalities. Acidity is proportional to hydronium ion concentration, um, is proportional to Ka, is proportional to one over pKa, is proportional to one over pH. Okay, so I think that all of the things we've looked at so far, and of course you could do the same with basicity. Basicity is proportional to hydroxide concentration, proportional to Kb, proportional to one over pKb, proportional to P, sorry, one over pOH. So you could do exactly the same for the base form. Okay, and obviously you can pause that and have a mull over that. Okay, POH, we've said some stuff about, but it's formally presented here. Um, it's just the P, which by definition is minus log base 10, and instead of H meaning hydronium, we have the hydroxide. Um, remember, we have... Uh, this is the Kw value. This is the autoionization of water. The product of hydronium and hydroxide at 25 degrees Celsius. If we take the negative logarithm to base 10 of all sides, so we take the hydronium, add negative log base 10, if we take the log of a product, you add them. So recall your log rules, log uh, uh, log of a product, log of AB is log of A plus log of B. So that's just one of your many log rules. So this product 
suddenly becomes a plus as soon as we have the logs involved. By definition, we're adding negative logs just because we want positive values at the end. That's how we convert negative exponents to positive coefficients. Um, by definition, if this is the kw, then this is the pkw, right? And so we've got a new expression here. The pH plus the POH is the pkw. And numerically, it's equal to 14. So if we ever have pH and we want the POH, we can just use the number 14 to help us calculate the thing that we don't have. Okay. Um, often in the lab, you will have universal indicator paper or litmus paper. And typically, no matter what color the paper is initially, if it goes red, that's a sign that you have acid, an acidic environment. So typically, red means acid. So whenever an indicator paper turns red, you have the presence of acid. Whenever you have a blue or something less red, you have base. And you can have, um, you know, this looks like basic litmus paper, but you can have a variety of colors if you had, it's actually right below here, if you had something like universal indicator paper, where you could have a range from uh, one being red through the colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And so the bluey end is the basic end and the ready end is the acidic end. Okay. Um, a bit more accurately, if you're going to do any, you know, a, a quick and dirty indication of the pH, you can use some paper. If you want some decimals and some significance in a calculation, you would use a pH probe. Uh, pH probes essentially measure the conductance and convert it to a pH. So that's why you have a little uh, conductance probe here. Um, and um, so you, you could measure it that way as well. And when I say conductance, obviously uh, um, acidity measures free ions. So the more free ions, the more conductance you can have, and it just converts conductance into a numerical value. Uh, here's some useful uh, conversions for calculations. So we've seen that pKw is the sum of pH and pOH, which is the total range of the pH scale, which is 14. We've got interconversions of pH and, and hydronium using um, this scale, the pH scale. And I can also add, you could have hydronium is base 10 to the negative pH. Likewise, you can take hydroxide is base 10 to the negative pOH. If you want to go back and forth, and it's important that you learn how to do this on a calculator. So I would definitely take a pH, you know, and try and go back to the pOH. Take a pOH, you know, try and go back to the pH or what? Of the hydroxide, etc., and then you have the KW. So whether you have a hydronium and you want the hydroxide, you can use this relationship. If you have the pH and you want the hydronium, you can use these relationships. If you have the pH and you want the pOH, you can use these relationships. Okay. Final topic on this video is looking at polyprotic acids. So let's have a look at that, and then we'll wrap up the second video. So protic just means proton. Poly means many. So an acid that's polyprotic has many protons. Um, it has to be ionizable. It doesn't just mean total hydrogen. It means an acidic hydrogen or a hydrogen that's capable of being donated to form a hydronium in solution. So common examples are sulfuric acid, which you can tell is diprotic. So it's polyprotic in general, 
for it's specifically diprotic because it has two protons. So di means two. And here they are, one, two. Uh, phosphoric acid is triprotic. And here they are, one, two, three. However, not all protons are created equal. Now, strike that. Quantum mechanically, protons are created equal. But they don't all have a similar uh, life world line in a solution. Um, because if you release one, what, you know, if you think about it, you know, why is this just common sense that they don't all have a similar, let's consider H2SO4. We'd have H2SO4, put that in water, and that would uh, give you, so H2SO4 is a strong acid, but only one of the protons is released completely you would get HSO4 minus and hydronium. But so that Ka would be a lot greater than one. But then you've got the second one comes from a different species. You know, the first one came from H2SO4. The second one is coming from HSO4 minus. So HSO4 minus is a different beast altogether because it's got a negative charge for one, that H plus as it's trying to leave is gonna be attracted to the negative charge. So you're gonna have equilibrium, have a weaker system to have, um, to have, sorry, I can't write and speak at the same time, to have SO4 two minus and hydronium so this K, let's call that K1 and K2, different. So the predominant species are different. So here we have, this is the predominant species. Let's call it predominant species. But here we have, um, So this is the predominant species for the first acid. This is the predominant species for the second acid um, because of the K values. So let me scroll to the very last page. Okay. And as you can see here for the, oh, I didn't realize this was here, my bad. Um, you can see here that the K is large, so this would be considered a strong acid, but this species is a weak acid because the K is less. And we've argued why there's gonna be electrostatic attraction as that proton is released and it tries to mop up a, a water molecule or it's mopped up by a water molecule, it's gonna be pulled back. And so statistically, it's less likely to leave in the first place. Um, um, okay, let's look at some values here. So we've got, um, here's phosphoric acid, which we just saw. Let's look at the values. So phosphoric acid is a weak acid because its K values are less than one. But notice, although it's weak, it gets weaker with each proton. So the first equilibrium constant is around 10 to the negative three. The next one is 10 to the negative eight, much weaker. And the final one is 10 to the negative 13. And if you look, the first one, you're just trying to, um, you're departing from a neutral molecule. The second one, you're departing from a negatively charged molecule. It's harder to do. The third one, you're trying to depart from something with two negative charges, even harder to do. Um, and citric acid is another example. It's a weak acid. And you can see here, the first K value is larger than the second, larger than the third. Um, so typically, uh, here's the expression here that's worth noting. 
k values tend to get uh, smaller as you go. And um, that will conclude acid-base theory video number two.